As part of our course on linear system theory, this lecture is about controllability and observability of linear systems. We begin with definition 13.1 of controllability for a discrete time linear time varying system as stated in equation 18 and which has the state equation x of k plus 1 is equal to a of k times x of k plus b of k times u of k. And this system is called controllable on an interval from k0 to k1 if for all possible states x0 and x1 there exists a corresponding control sequence u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1 such that if we start from the initial state x of k0 is equal to x0 we end up at the final state x of k1 is equal to x1. In other words, loosely speaking, the system is called controllable on a given time interval if for any given initial state and any given goal state it's possible to find a sequence of control inputs that steer the system from the initial state to the goal state. Note that definition 13.1 requires that both the initial state and the final state be arbitrary. Clearly, if we have a time varying system, the controllability may depend on the choice of the interval from k0 to k1. For a time invariant system, as we shall see in a couple of slides, it just depends on the length of this interval but not the starting time. It's also important to note that the definition only requires that the system reaches the state x1 at time k1, but not that the state remains at x1 beyond the time k1. In the following, instead of calling the system controllable, we will also simply call the pair AB controllable on a given time interval. Definition 13.2 defines that a state x1 is called reachable on a given discrete time interval by the pair AB if there exists a sequence of control inputs u of k0 through u of k1 minus 1 such that it's possible to steer the state of the system to x1 at time k1 starting at the origin at time k0. The set of all reachable states is called the reachable subspace of the system on the given discrete time interval. The first little result in this chapter, fact 13.3, states that for any discrete time linear system and any discrete time interval, the reachable subspace of the system is indeed a subspace of the state space in the sense of definition 4.14. For the proof of fact 13.3, we recursively express all states in the relevant time interval in terms of the relevant inputs from u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1. First, x of k0 plus 1 is given by a of k0 x of k0 plus b of k0 u of k0 due to the dynamics of the system. By assumption x of k0 is equal to 0 and hence x of k0 plus 1 is equal to b of k0 times u of k0. Moving one step ahead, x of k0 plus 2 is given by a of k0 plus 1 x of k0 plus 1 plus b of k0 plus 1 u of k0 plus 1 by the dynamics of the system. Here we can substitute the expression for x of k0 plus 1 and we get this expression. Another step ahead, x of k0 plus 3 is given by a of k0 plus 2 x of k0 plus 2 plus b of k0 plus 2 u of k0 plus 2 where we can again substitute the expression for x of k0 plus 2 that we have just obtained and we get this expression here. 
continuing this process up to x of k1, which is equal to a of k1 minus 1 x of k1 minus 1 plus b of k1 minus 1 u of k1 minus 1, we obtain this formula, which expresses x of k1 in terms of all the inputs from u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1. Now, let x tilde 1 and x bar 1 be any two elements of the reachable subspace, meaning that there exist input sequences u tilde k0 up to u tilde k1 minus 1 and u bar k0 up to u bar k1 minus 1 that drive the system from the initial state x of k0, which is the origin, to x tilde 1 and x bar 1 respectively. In other words, if I substitute this input sequence into this formula, I obtain x tilde 1 on the left hand side, and if I substitute this input sequence into this formula, I obtain x bar 1 on the left hand side. By theorem 4.15, in order to show that the reachable subspace is indeed a subspace of Rn in the linear algebra sense, it suffices to show that alpha times x1 tilde and x tilde 1 plus x bar 1 are both contained in the reachable subspace for any value of alpha. As one can easily verify by substituting into the above formula and using linearity, the input sequence that results if I multiply every input u tilde of k0 up to u tilde of k1 minus 1 with the scalar alpha drives the system from the origin to alpha times x1 tilde and therefore alpha times x1 tilde is an element of the reachable subspace. Similarly, by the above formula and linearity, the addition of the two input sequences u tilde of k0 up to u tilde of k1 minus 1 and u bar of k0 up to u bar of k1 minus 1 drives the system from the origin to the sum of the two states x1 tilde and x1 bar and hence x1 tilde plus x1 bar is an element of the reachable subspace. Hence we have concluded the proof. Having understood this, fact 13.4 now states that the discrete time linear time varying system is controllable on this discrete time interval if and only if its reachable subspace is equal to the entire state space Rn. This is the reason why the reachable subspace is also called the controllable subspace. For the proof of fact 13.4, we split this if and only if statements in its two directions. First, sufficiency is obvious because if the system is controllable on the discrete time interval, by definition this means that I can drive it from any initial state x of k0 to any final state x of k1. Hence, the reachable subspace, meaning the set of states that I can reach from the origin in this discrete time interval, is equal to Rn. Now to prove necessity, pick any arbitrary states x0 and x1 in Rn. As in the proof before, we then recursively express all states x of k0 plus 1 up to x of k1 in terms of the inputs u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1, with the only difference that now the initial condition x of k0 is not equal to 0, but it's equal to the given initial condition x0, and hence by the recursive substitution of x of k0 plus 1 into x of k0 plus 2, and x of k0 plus 2 into x of k0 plus 3, and so on, we always obtain one additional term, which contains this non-zero initial condition x0. So finally, when we get to x of k1, 
we have the same expression that we had before when the initial condition was zero and which depends on all the inputs from u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1. And we have this additional term which results from the initial condition x0. Moreover, what we need to prove is that we are able to steer the system to the state x1 in the time step k1 so that this x of k1 is actually equal to x1. Next, by bringing this term to the left hand side of the equation with a simple subtraction, we obtain that the condition here is equivalent to this condition. But looking at this last equation more closely, we realize that for an arbitrary choice of x0 and x1, we simply have an arbitrary vector here on the left hand side. And we know that the reachable subspace of the system is equal to Rn, meaning that this vector on the right hand side can be made into any vector in Rn by appropriate choice of the inputs and hence it's possible to represent the left hand side for any choice of x0 and x1 by choosing the appropriate inputs on the right hand side. Thus, as we have just seen in fact 13.4, for controllability it's sufficient to consider the reachable subspace. Obviously, for discrete time linear time invariant systems, the reachable subspace only depends on the time difference between k1 and k0. Hence, without any loss of generality, for the controllability of discrete time linear time invariant systems, it suffices to consider only the reachable subspace for the time interval from 0 to delta k, which obviously has to be all of Rn in order for the system to be controllable. Now, the property of controllability still depends on the choice of the time difference delta k. In other words, the system may be not controllable if delta k is chosen too small, and it may become controllable if delta k is chosen large enough. But the question is, how large is large enough? And lemma 13.5 will show that if the discrete time linear time invariant system is not controllable for delta k being equal to n, where n is the dimension of the state space, then it will not be controllable for any delta k greater than n. So we don't have to extend this time period indefinitely in order to find out whether the system becomes controllable at some point, but we only have to extend it up to delta k being equal to n and if the system is not controllable at this point, then it will never become controllable no matter how large we choose this delta k. And that's what's stated more concisely in lemma 13.5, namely, the reachable subspace of a discrete time linear time invariant system for the time period from 0 to n remains the same as the reachable subspace that can be generated in any time period which is longer than n, where n represents the dimension of the state of the system. For the proof of lemma 13.5, we first define that sk denotes the reachable subspace of the system in k steps. Then we split the proof into two parts. In the first part, we prove that Sn is a subset of Sk if k is greater than or equal to n, which means that if the time interval is increased from n steps to k steps, where k is greater than or equal to n, then the reachable subspace can never shrink, but it can only increase. So pick any element x bar of the reachable subspace Sn, then by the definition of the reachable subspace and by theorem 9.25 there exist corresponding control inputs u bar 0 up to u bar n minus 1 such that x bar which is 
the nth state x of n is equal to a to the n times x0, where x0 is the origin, plus the forced solution over the time period from 0 to n involving all of the control inputs u bar from 0 up to n minus 1. Now suppose that any value of k greater than or equal to n is given. In order to show that as k is a superset of s n, we have to show that this arbitrary point of s n, x bar, is also contained in s k. To this end, we define the input sequence from u0 up to u k minus 1, which consists of k minus n zeros at the beginning, and then the input sequence u bar naught up to u bar n minus 1, which we have used up here to bring the system to x bar. Then clearly, if the system starts at the initial condition x not equal to 0, and we apply this input sequence, then the system will stay at the origin for the first k minus n steps, and then the remainder of the input sequence will drive the system to the state x bar. Formally stated, by theorem 9.25, the state x of k is equal to a to the k times x naught, which is chosen to be 0, plus the sum of the forced solution, where the sum of the forced solution is now the same as the forced solution up here, and hence x of k is equal to x bar, and therefore x bar is an element of the reachable subspace sk. In the second part of the proof, we have to show the reverse containment, namely that sk is a subset of sn if k is greater than or equal to n. To this end, we will first show that sn plus 1 is a subset of sn, and then the result will follow by induction. Observe from the argument made up here, a point is an element of Sn if, and only if, by the definition of a reachable subspace and by theorem 9.25, x bar can be expressed like this, where the initial condition x0 is equal to 0. In other words, x bar is an element of Sn if, and only if, there exist control inputs, u of 0, u of 1, and so on, up to u of n minus 1, such that x bar can be written as this sum, because this term here is 0, where the sum can also be written as this sum with n terms, starting with a to the n minus 1 times b times u of 0, and so on, up to b times u of n minus 1, where this follows by just spelling out this sum. Now we can rephrase this statement in terms of the range spaces of these matrices, because we are allowed to pick any control inputs in order to get to x bar. Therefore, we can say that Sn, which is the set of all possible x bar, that we can achieve by choosing these control inputs is equal to the range space of this matrix together with the range space of this matrix together with all of these range spaces up to the range space of this matrix. Therefore, we can say that Sn is equal to the union of all of the range spaces of a to the n minus 1b, a to the n minus 2b, and so on, down to b. And similarly, Sn plus 1 is equal to the union of the range spaces a to the nb, a to the n minus 1b, a to the n minus 2b, and so on, down to b. Note that from these expressions, you can clearly see that Sn must be a subset of Sn plus 1, which is the result that we have proved in part 1. And that's because all of the range spaces that make up Sn are also contained in Sn plus 1, 
and as n plus 1 has the additional range space of the matrix A to the n B. So what remains to be done for the proof of part 2 is to show that the range space of the matrix A to the n B is contained in Sn, meaning in the union of all of the other range spaces. In order to prove this, we invoke the Cayley-Hamilton theorem from chapter 8, according to which there exist scalars alpha naught through alpha n minus 1, such that the matrix polynomial a to the n plus alpha n minus 1 a to the n minus 1 and so on down to alpha naught times identity is equal to 0. Now we can bring all of these terms except a to the n to the right hand side and multiply the entire equation with b from the right and we obtain that a to the n times b is equal to minus alpha n minus 1 a to the n minus 1 b minus alpha n minus 2 a to the n minus 2 b and so on down to alpha 0 times b. Therefore, we observe that the matrix A to the n B can be expressed as a linear combination of A to the n minus 1 B, A to the n minus 2 B, and so on, and B, which implies that the range space of A to the n B has to be a subset of the union of all of these range spaces. And this is what we needed to show, and hence our proof is complete. Knowing the fact that if a discrete time linear time invariant system is controllable on the time interval from 0 to n, then it will be controllable on any longer time interval, we can state definition 13.6, calling the system simply controllable if it is controllable on this time interval from 0 to n. In other words, if we refer to a linear time invariant system to be controllable, meaning that we omit the time interval, then we implicitly mean that it is controllable on the time interval from 0 to n. In theorem 13.7, we have the first controllability results for discrete time linear time invariant systems, for which we can define the so-called controllability matrix denoted with a capital letter P and which is defined by having the columns of B as its first few columns, then the columns of AB as its next few columns, then the columns of A squared B and so on up to the columns of A to the n minus 1 B. And the result now says that the discrete time linear time invariant system is controllable if and only if this controllability matrix has rank n. Note that since A is an n by n matrix and B is an n by m matrix, the controllability matrix has the dimensions n by n times m. So it's not necessarily a square matrix. Now to the proof of theorem 13.7, by definition 13.6, the system is called controllable or controllable on the time interval from 0 to n if and only if the reachable subspace for this time interval called Sn is equal to the entire space Rn. From the proof of lemma 13.5, recall that a state x bar is an element of the reachable subspace Sn if and only if there exist control inputs u of 0 up to u of n minus 1 such that x bar can be written as a to the n minus 1 b u of 0 plus a to the n minus 2 b u of 1 and so on down to b times u of n minus 1. Next, observe that by reversing the order of these terms and writing this equation collectively by one big matrix, 
times one big vector, x bar can be expressed by a large matrix vector multiplication, where the matrix happens to be equal to the controllability matrix and the vector consists of the stacked up control inputs starting with u of n minus 1 down to u of 1 and u of 0. Therefore, Sn is equal to the range space of the controllability matrix P and hence Sn is equal to Rn if and only if the rank of the controllability matrix is equal to n, which concludes our proof. Another remark on theorem 13.7 is that it only provides a yes or no answer about the question of controllability of a system. No statement is given about the degree of controllability. At this point, degree of controllability is not a precisely defined term. What we mean by this intuitive term, we will try to make clear in the next two examples. In the first example, we suppose the system has the system matrix A1 and the input matrix B1, so that the controllability matrix P1 is given by B1 and A1, B1, which, if you calculate this matrix, looks like this. Since the rank of P1 is clearly equal to 2, which is the dimension of the state of system 1, system 1 is clearly controllable. In the second example, the system has the system matrix A2 and the input matrix B2, and if we again calculate the controllability matrix P2, we obtain this matrix here, which also obviously has rank 2, and hence the system is controllable. However, to answer the question about the degree of controllability, we compare the control actions or control inputs that are required, for instance, to go from the state 0, 0 to the state 1, 1. How to actually calculate these control inputs is left to you as an exercise, but for system 1, we get the control inputs u of 0 equal to 1 and u of 1 equal to 1. And for system 2, we get u of 0 equal to 100 and u of 1 equal to minus 99. Hence, for system 1, in order to get from the initial state to the target state, requires relatively modest values of the control input, whereas for system 2, relatively high values of the control input are required in order to transfer the state in certain directions or modes of the state space. Here, that's because of the relatively small entry of 0.01 in the system matrix, which if it converged to zero, the system would actually become uncontrollable. So in some intuitive sense, one could say that system 2 is somehow close to being uncontrollable. Again, all the concepts that we have just defined for discrete time systems carry over almost analogously to the continuous time case. First, in definition 13.8, a continuous time linear time varying system with this state equation is called controllable on the time interval from t0 to t1 if for any choice of initial state x0 and target state x1 there exists a control input u of t on the time interval t0 to t1 such that the state at t0 is equal to x0 and the state at t1 is equal to x1. As before, definition 13.8 requires that both the initial state x0 and the final state x1 be arbitrary. For general time varying systems, controllability may clearly depend on the choice of the time interval. Again, the statement of definition 13.8 only requires that the system reaches the state x1 at time t1 
but not that it remains at x1 for times greater than t1. And instead of the system being controllable on the time interval, we will also simply call the pair a and b to be controllable on this time interval. Then, according to definition 13.9, a state x1 is called reachable on the time interval from t0 to t1 by the pair AB if there exists a control signal U of t on this time interval such that starting from the origin at time t0, the system is steered to the state x1 at time t1. And the set of all reachable states is called the reachable subspace on the time interval from t0 to t1. In definition 13.10, the reachability map, which is denoted with LR, is defined for a continuous time linear time variance system. And what it does is that it maps any m-dimensional continuous function on the interval from t0 to t1 to a vector in Rn. And it does so by assigning to u of t the vector given by this expression, which is known to us from theorem 9.12 in chapter 9 as the solution of a continuous time state space model. To make this complicated looking map a little more intuitive, we think of an element in the domain of this map as an input signal u of t on the interval from t0 to t1 and of the codomain as the set of target states x of t1. Then what the map does is by assuming that x of t0 is equal to 0, it provides the state that the system is steered to by using the input signal u of t. Then, analogous to the discrete time case, it's not hard to show that for any time interval t0 to t1, the reachable subspace of a continuous time linear time varying system is a subspace of Rn in the linear algebra sense. To see this, we just need to notice that the reachable subspace of the system is equal to the range space of the linear operator LR, which can easily be shown to satisfy the conditions set out in theorem 4.15, namely closure under scalar multiplication and under vector addition. Moreover, a continuous time linear time varying system is controllable on the interval t0 to t1 if and only if its reachable subspace is all of Rn. Therefore, the reachable subspace will also be referred to as the controllable subspace. This result is analogous to fact 13.4 for discrete time systems, and the proof is also very similar, hence it's omitted. Next, let's take a look at what this means for the continuous time linear time invariant case by fact 13.12. For controllability, it suffices to consider the reachable subspace, which has to be all of the state space in order for the system to be controllable. Clearly, for linear time invariant systems, the reachable subspace does not depend on the initial time, but only on the time difference between the final time and the initial time, which we call delta t. With the first two bullet points, for the controllability of a linear time invariant system, it hence suffices to consider only the reachable subspace on the interval from 0 to delta t. Now recall that for continuous time linear time invariant systems, the fundamental matrix phi of delta t and 0 is given by the matrix exponential e to the a delta t which can also be written as this infinite matrix polynomial. Also, for the continuous time case, 
we can provide a simple condition to check the controllability of a continuous time linear time invariant system in terms of the so-called controllability matrix, which is defined in the same way as for the discrete time case. In fact, the continuous time linear time invariant system is controllable if and only if the controllability matrix has rank n. For the proof of theorem 13.13, .13, we first fix any delta t which is positive and by fact 13.12 we observe that controllability of the pair AB on the interval from 0 to delta t is equivalent to the reachable subspace on that time interval being equal to Rn. By theorem 9.12, any x bar in the reachable subspace can be expressed by the formula for x of delta t, where we let the initial condition x of 0 be 0 in accordance with the definition of the reachable subspace. And then using the formula in 9.12, we get this formula for x bar. Now we can substitute the matrix exponential with its definition in terms of this infinite matrix polynomial. And then by linearity of the integration, we can split up the integral of this sum into the sum of the integrals. And moreover, we can pull out any constant factor in each integral into the front of the integral so that we obtain that this is equal to b times the integral from 0 to delta t of u of tau d tau plus a b times the integral from 0 to delta t of delta t minus tau u of tau d tau plus a squared b times the integral from 0 to delta t of 1 over 2 factorial times delta t minus tau squared u of tau d tau and so on. Note that for the first term we have pulled the constant factor b out of the integral. For the second term, we have pulled a times b out of the integral. For the third term, we have pulled a squared b out of the integral, and so on. Next, we define these integrals in the infinite sum as new vectors, which we call u tilde of 0, u tilde of 1, u tilde of 2, and so on. Observe that each of these new variables is an m-dimensional vector because it's the result of the integration of an m-dimensional vector with respect to time. If these newly defined vectors u tilde of 0, u tilde of 1, u tilde of 2 and so on can be chosen independently of each other by an appropriate selection of the control input signal u of t on the interval from 0 to delta tau, then we observe that the situation reduces to that of a discrete time system, which we have proven in theorem 13.7. In fact, if each of these vectors can be chosen independently, then the set of all states x bar in the reachable subspace is given by the range space of B union with the range space of AB union with the range space of A squared B and so on. Hence, we can again apply the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, define the controllability matrix and so on. Now, this independence condition is indeed satisfied because the set of polynomials 1 delta t minus tau 1 over 2 factorial delta t minus tau squared, 1 over 3 factorial, delta t minus tau cubed, and so on, are linearly independent in the vector space of continuous functions on the interval from 0 to delta tau, according to proposition 4.6. An interesting corollary, 13.14, of this theorem is that if a continuous time linear time invariance system is controllable on some interval from 0 to delta t or from t0 to 
to T1, then it is controllable on any interval from T0 to T1, where T1 just has to be greater than T0. And that's because if it is controllable on some interval, by theorem 13.13, .13, we have that the controllability matrix has rank n. And since the controllability matrix has rank n, then again, by this if and only if, the system will be controllable on any other time interval. Hence, it is justified to simply call the system controllable or not controllable. Again, as for the discrete time case, theorem 13.13 .13 only provides a yes or no answer to the question of controllability of a system and no statement is made about the degree of controllability, meaning how much control effort is actually needed to bring certain initial states to certain target states. With the end of this slide, we have finished the concept of controllability for discrete time and continuous time linear systems. And we will now move on to the concept of observability, which in some sense is quite related to controllability, as we shall see later on. We start the part on observability again with the discrete time case, and we start again with the more general type of linear time varying systems. Following definition 13.15, a discrete time linear time varying system is called observable on the time interval from k0 to k1 minus 1 if for any initial state x0 and any given input and output sequence, the knowledge of all the inputs from u of k0 up to u of k1 minus 1 and all the outputs from y of k0 to y of k1 minus 1 suffices to entirely reconstruct the initial state x0. To make our terminology a little simpler, similar to controllability, instead of calling the system observable, we will also simply call the pair C and A observable on the interval from K0 to K1. Another thing that sometimes leads to some misunderstanding in definition 13.15 is that the system dynamics, so all of these matrices, are assumed to be known for the purposes of reconstructing the initial state x0. So in summary, what's known is the system itself, the inputs to the system over the time period from k0 to k1 minus 1, and the outputs of the system for the same time period. And the question is, does all of this information suffice to calculate the initial state of the system x0 at the time k0. Note also that if it's possible to determine the initial state x0 based on all of this information, then we can easily reconstruct the entire state sequence for all times k greater than or equal to k0, so over the entire time interval, by simply propagating this initial state through the dynamics of the system, which are given by these matrices. Next, we proceed to the linear time invariant case, where we have definition 13.16, stating that a discrete time linear time invariant system, as shown here, is called simply observable without a time interval, if it is observable on the interval from zero to n minus 1, where again n denotes the dimension of the system state. Theorem 13.17 states that a discrete time linear time invariant system is observable in the sense of definition 13.16 if and only if the so called observability matrix, which is defined like this, has rank n. Note that for the observability matrix, we use the capital letter Q, and as opposed to the controllability matrix, 
which was defined column-wise, the observability matrix is defined row-wise, and the first rows are given by the output matrix C, the next rows are given by the rows of the matrix C times A, and so on, up to the last rows, which are given by C times A to the n minus 1. Hence, the dimensions of the observability matrix are such that it has n times p rows and n columns. Hence, it's not necessarily a square matrix. For the proof of theorem 13.17, we first recall what is given in our problem of determining the initial state x0, given are the system matrices A, B, C, and D, the control inputs applied to the system U of 0 up to U of n minus 1, and the outputs of the system Y of 0 up to Y of n minus 1. So the question is, when is it possible to calculate the initial state X0 based on these data? As we have seen a couple of times in the controllability part of this chapter, the first couple of states of the system can be written as x of 0 is equal to x0, x of 1 is equal to a times x of 0 plus b times u of 0, where we can now replace x of 0 with x0, so this is equal to a times x0 plus b times u of 0. Then x of 2 is equal to a times x of 1 plus b times u of 1, where we can replace x of 1 with this expression, and hence we obtain that this is equal to a squared times x0 plus ab times u of 0 plus b times u of 1, and so on. By using the output equation of the system, the first couple of outputs of the system can be written as follows. y of 0 is equal to c times x of 0 plus d times u of 0, where we can now substitute our expression for x of 0 from up here, and we obtain that this is equal to c times x0 plus d times u of 0. Then for y of 1, we have that this is equal to c times x of 1 plus d times u of 1, where we can now substitute our expression for x of 1 from up here, and we obtain that this is equal to c a x0 plus c b times u of 0 plus d times u of 1. The next output, y of 2, is equal to c times x of 2 plus d times u of 2, where we can substitute our expression for x of 2 and we obtain c a squared times x0 plus c a b u of 0 plus c b u of 1 plus d u of 2. And we can continue in this fashion for the subsequent outputs y3, y4, and so on. Next, what we'll do is we'll solve each equation for the term that contains x0 by bringing all these other terms on the right-hand side to the left-hand sides of the equations. The result of this step looks like this, where we now have on the left-hand side the expressions c times x0, c times a times x0, c times a squared times x0, and so on. And the right-hand sides have become expressions that only contain the known control inputs to the system and the known control outputs of the system. So essentially, the right-hand sides represent known vectors, which we can call y tilde of 0, y tilde of 1, y tilde of 2, and so on. Since all of the vectors on the right-hand side, y tilde of 0, y tilde of 1, y tilde of 2, and so on, are known, we can write the first n such equations as one big equation system where x0 is the unknown vector. Note that the coefficient matrix of this equation system turns out to be the observability matrix Q, 
and the right hand side consists of the stacked up vectors y tilde of 0, y tilde of 1, y tilde of 2 and so on down to y tilde of n minus 1. Now what about the existence and the uniqueness of a solution to this equation system? We don't really need to worry about existence because we know that the data that we have, which is encoded here, is a valid input-output data for the system given the initial condition x0. In other words, at least the true initial condition x0, which is unknown to us, must be a valid solution to this equation system. So the real question here is about uniqueness. When does this system of equation permit only a single solution for x0, which then has to be the true initial condition of the system? From our knowledge about linear equation systems, we know that the solution to this system of linear equations is unique if and only if the null space of the matrix Q is trivial. And by using theorem 6.11, this holds if and only if the rank of Q is equal to n, and this completes our proof. Based on theorem 13.17, we have the result of corollary 13.18, namely, if a discrete time linear time invariant system is not observable on the time interval from 0 to n minus 1, then it won't be observable on any longer time interval from 0 to k, where k is greater than or equal to n minus 1. So this is an equivalent result to the case of controllability, where we have seen that if a system is not controllable on the interval from 0 to n, then it won't be controllable on any longer time interval. As you can probably guess by now, at the core of the proof of corollary 13.18 is again the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which states that a to the power n can be expressed as a matrix polynomial of A of degree n minus 1, meaning that there exist scalars alpha n minus 1 down to alpha 0, such that A to the n can be written as a linear combination of lower powers of A. Now, if the system is not observable on the time interval from 0 to n minus 1, by the proof of theorem 13.17, this means that there must exist a vector x0 bar in the null space of Q, which is non-trivial. And since the vector x0 bar is in the null space of Q, this means that the matrix Q times this vector is equal to the zero vector. Note that this is equivalent to the single conditions that c times x0 bar is equal to 0, ca times x0 bar is equal to 0, ca squared times x0 bar is equal to 0, down to ca to the n minus 1 times x0 bar is equal to 0. Now consider the expression c times a to the n times x0 bar. Here we can replace a to the n with this finite polynomial according to the Cayley-Hamilton theorem and we obtain this expression where we can now pull the c from the left into each of the terms of the polynomial. And similarly, we can pull the vector x0 bar from the right into each of the terms of the polynomial. And what we obtain is this expression where now each of the terms is a scalar multiple of an expression of the type c times a to the n minus 1 times x0 bar, c times a to the n minus 2 times x0 bar, down to c times a times x0 bar and c times x0 bar. And all of these expressions, according to the equations above here, are zero, and hence the entire expression has to be equal to zero. Therefore, 
it follows that x0 bar is also in the null space of this even bigger matrix compared to this one, where we have added the additional rows of c times a to the n. And by the argument used in theorem 13.17, this implies that the system is also not observable on the interval from 0 to n. So what we have shown is that if the system is not observable on the interval from 0 to n minus 1, then it is also not observable on the interval from 0 to n. The result that we want to prove is now very close. We just need an additional induction argument. So consider the expression c times a to the power n plus 1 times x0 bar, which can also be written as c times a times a to the power n times x0 bar, where we can again use the Cayley-Hamilton theorem to replace a to the power n with a matrix polynomial in A of degree n minus 1. And then we can pull the factor c times a from the left into the front of each of the terms in the brackets and the vector x0 bar from the right into the rear of each of these terms. And we obtain this equation where again, by using star star, each of these expressions is equal to zero and hence the whole expression is equal to zero. Now we can continue the same argument for c times a to the n plus 2 times x0 bar and so on up to c times a to the k times x0 bar and all of them will be equal to zero. Thus, the system is not observable on the time interval from 0 to k and we have proved our result. As a remark about corollary 13.18, note that if a discrete time linear time system is observable on the interval from 0 to n minus 1, then it may or may not be observable on a shorter time period from 0 to k, where k is less than n minus 1. It's left as an exercise to you to find an example of a system which is in fact observable for a k which is less than n minus 1. Similar to controllability, again, theorem 13.17 just provides a yes or no answer to the question of observability, but it provides no result about the degree of observability of the system. In fact, as we can guess by now, there's a strong relationship between the property of controllability and the property of observability. And that relationship is called duality in linear system theory. The specific statement of this property of duality is that the pair CA is observable if and only if the pair A star C star is controllable. In the spirit of this duality, there also exists an equivalent notion to what is called the reachable subspace for controllability in the realm of observability. This notion is called the unobservable subspace. And specifically, it's defined as the null space of the observability matrix Q. Now that we have defined the reachable subspace, and the unobservable subspace of a system, it should be noted that there is no such thing as an observable subspace or an unreachable subspace for a system. And you are advised to take a minute to think about the question why this is the case. Next, we move on to the concept of observability for continuous time systems, starting again with the more general linear time varying case. Following definition 13.20, a continuous time linear time varying system, as shown here, is called observable on the time interval from t0 to t1 if for any initial state x0 and any input and output signals u of t and y of t on the given time interval, knowledge of these 
input and output signals suffice to determine the initial state of the system x0. Again, instead of calling the system observable on the time interval, we will also simply call the pair CA observable on this time interval. And just like in the discrete time case, the system dynamics in terms of the matrices A, B, C, and D are assumed to be completely known. And therefore, if the initial state x0 can be determined, then the entire state sequence for all t greater than or equal to t0 can be constructed by means of knowing the system matrices and the control input and the output of the system. In the continuous time linear time invariant case, we again have an observability theorem like the one we have for discrete time systems. And it says that the continuous time linear time invariant system is observable if and only if the observability matrix Q, which is defined in the same way as for discrete time systems, has rank n. And again, the remark here that the observability matrix is not necessarily a square matrix, it has the dimensions NP times N. The proof of theorem 13.21 is omitted here since it's an interpolation of the proofs of controllability of discrete time and continuous time systems and observability of discrete time systems, which we have already looked at before. Finally, unsurprisingly, we have corollary 13.22, stating that if a continuous time linear time invariant system is observable on some time interval from 0 to delta t or t0 to t1, then it is observable on all time intervals t0 to t1 whenever t1 is greater than t0. Hence, it's justified to simply call this system observable and to omit the indication of the time period on which the system is observable.